All right. Cool. Because Bye. we're hearing what you have to say. And uh, last time, you know, we got some feedback, you know, still here in the AWS deployment stuff from a lot of people. Um, we're hearing that you want to go more deep into evaluation frameworks. We have this teed up for you on Thursday. Where you want to go deeper into prompt management, versioning, what a prompt cache looks like. Let's say we have this teed up for you as well coming your way. Um, Llama index versus Langchain. Maybe that's going to have to make it to a community sesh. We're going to cover that and make it like a deep dive thing in, in future cohorts. Um, you, we can basically share our opinions offline about that. I don't think we're, that's going to make it into the curriculum over the next week and a half. And, you know, the projects, I think there are better ways to do it. So thank, thank you for everybody. Feedback on the projects. Uh, rather than taking up an hour of in-class time, we'll probably do a little bit differently next time. So the other thing I wanted to give you all a, a bit of feedback on as well is like, I'm getting a lot of great information from reviewing your homeworks. So I reviewed everybody's homework that submitted. I think there, you know, Maven again is leaving me very wanting with the homework situation and setup and grading situation, the share your work thing. I, I just, I don't love it in any way, but what I did love is I loved everybody that filled out the lessons not yet learned. And so I collected a few here uh, and I didn't sort of duplicate anything. I just wanted to show everybody what sort of everybody's asking for. And I think we're all sort of aligned in similar ways. So deploying and what we're going to do is we're going to sort of like rapid fire to Chris here. Um, and we're going to we're going to see if he can sort of chunk away some of these questions as they come up. So we're not going to spend too much time on this, but deploying to AWS, deploying at scale robust, scalable manner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're getting a lot of this kind of thing. People want it real bad. So we are going to actually start covering this today. I'm happy to report. Um, CI, CD pipelines for LLMs. Chris, do you have a hot take for 10 seconds on that? Uh, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's easiest if you can get the CI, CD set up. But for the most part, uh, you know, that's going to be not your first step. Once you get kind of the first step down, that's a great way to move into CI CD. Uh, there's like the basic versions, which is, you know, talking about uh, things like, um, you know, GitHub actions and stuff like this that you should always be doing. Uh, that's part of the every classic ops uh, pipeline. But uh, when it comes to LLMs, like you've got a lot of work to do before you really get into that. Yeah. And I believe that question was from a Dai Daiwa Dai Wei. Um, he's a DevOps engineer. So if you're interested in talking DevOps, I would uh, hit him up, see if any interesting discussion comes of it. We're, we're also getting a lot of feedback that maybe we could have covered Hugging Face a little bit better. Maybe we could have covered Chainlet a little bit better. Uh, I think Chris is going to dive into sort of showing a quick Chainlet application today, just as sort of a setting the tone for what we're going to build up this week. So we should be able to deal with some of these issues. I'm just going to point them out. So Chris has them in his head here. Uh, async versus sync, chainlet calling stuff, um, how to deal with these async calls when you're using hugging face, how to do more complex things with hugging face. And then one of the interesting sort of developer experience questions is talking about sort of modularizing things. So it's easier to sort of take the Jupyter notebook and use it directly on hugging face. Um, and then the, the great question was which front end stack would allow us to make this real because, uh, love that question, Raul, because we were obviously not building real things. Uh, Chris, do you have any, um, quick feedback on any of this, these things? Um, and what can we look forward to in the upcoming demo? Yeah. I mean, in terms of like making it real or anything like that, you become you're you're basically in a place where you need to actually get a front end team. So uh, you you kind of move, you know, outside of that uh, outside of that, you know, just the ops team. Um, you, you know, you need application development. Uh, everything else we'll talk about when we go through Chainlet a little bit more in depth today. Um, the idea, the idea is that you, you, the questions are great. And I think front end questions and that that's application development. You need, you know, a full stack engineer, uh, front end engineer, back end engineer, when we're talking about that part of the application stack. Uh, but if you need to react, 
Python React, right? There's a wrapper, straight up wrapper for Python for React. So uh, easy enough to use that. And uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it depends what you mean by real. I mean, obviously, you know, Raul, I think you're coming from a purely engineering perspective and, you know, from more of a founder perspective, it's like, dude, this is real enough to test with people. And like, so it's as yeah, real as it gets. From that, from that perspective, yeah. You know, so, yeah, yeah so I, I think, um, you know, I, I've had similar discussions with folks that, that I've built apps for where they're like, well, we want to release this publicly and it might get hit thousands of times. Like, what do we have to do between now and then? And, and I think we're going to start to shed some light on that with you guys today, at least on the back end serving side. Um, on the on the front end side, I think that's a little bit outside of the, the scope of this course. But I do believe we have a front end developer, Eka Mini, in the classroom now. So it might be worth following up with him and getting his two cents. A uh, couple more just questions. I wanted to just show you that we are listening to you guys. Like, it seems like there's a lot of interest in chunking, a lot of interest in looking into embeddings, a lot of interest in fine tuning. And a lot of this stuff, it just, you know, the hot take is, is that this stuff is not LLM ops. Okay. That, that's the hot take is like, this stuff is like basic LLM stuff that we all need to get good at and familiar with. And so it definitely fits within the realm of like future community sessions. Um, but in terms of, is this actually LLM ops? Is this actually like, I have my application, I need to build it. I need to make it, you know, this thing that's robust and, and useful. Uh, it's, it's a little bit precursor to that. It's a little bit of the data science before the machine learning engineering. And so I think this is one thing that we got a lot of opportunity space ahead, especially as we, you know, graduate this first cohort. Maybe there's a black art of chunking community session. You know, maybe there's an embeddings, um, embeddings leaderboard and, you know, embeddings, you know, obviously the, the hottest thing out there this week is like training your own embeddings, right? And everybody's jumping on it. Like maybe we should talk about that in a community sesh. Um, but there is a, a question here, you know, that potentially is, is interesting as well, how the LM interacts with the information retriever at a lower level. Um, and then we got some other retrieval questions here, what retrieval tool to use in general. So there's a lot of retriever type things coming up. I think these are great sort of questions to maybe throw into the discord more broadly to see if other folks have, you know, have thoughts, have interests in them. Uh, I just wanted to kind of get all these things out in front of everybody because, you know, when they're stuck in the homework submissions, nobody's ever going to see them but me. So uh, they're in the slides. And if you want to come back to this and you want to start some discussions with, pe with people, please do. We are going to go deeper on evaluation and, and benchmarking rags. And we are going to do that on Thursday. So, uh, but onward with the programming content today. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to do two things today. And we're going to converge these two things on Thursday. And these are, these are by popular demand. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to build out, first off, a quick proof of concept idea, okay? And this, uh, this idea is how can we question archive papers using a simple closed, closed source GPT 3.5 chain lit hugging face setup, okay? That's going to be sort of our first thing. And we're going to expand this idea out by the end of the week into like a full on production implementation. All right. But what we're going to do is we're going to split this today up into making sure we understand the POC level and then making sure we understand a simpler version of the production level. And then we're going to combine the two. All right. We're going to combine the two by the end of the week. So. You have been playing with these tools already. This is your opportunity, as Chris does the first demo today, to really dive in and ask more detailed questions. We're sort of showing this again here. Um, he is going to show the sort of end to end what it takes to build out this simple POC, but he's also going to show today what it takes to build out a production application using some tools that I think you guys will like. Of course, we've seen Chainlit Boilerplate. A lot of you have submitted. Great stuff. You're getting used to Chainlit. That's totally awesome. And when we're using Chainlit with Langchain, it's some pretty simple boilerplate. All right. 
So what we're going to do here is we're just going to show you how to kind of go through this flow. And this is the, the key flow that we want to incorporate for people, let's say one to 10 users at a time right now on a Hugging Face space. We want to specify a topic to search through archive papers. We want to get the top three papers. We want to convert those papers into embeddings. We want to be able to ask specific questions and we want to return the question, answers to questions with sources. So we're going to use Langchain, we're going to use Chroma, we're going to use the built-in archive retriever in Langchain, and we're also going to use OpenAI's GPT 3.5, okay? And we're going to do all of this just to sort of set the tone for the week. So if you have, if this is starting to feel familiar to you and starting to feel easy, then like you're crushing right now, okay? But this is sort of your opportunity to kind of go a little bit deeper and maybe ask some of those more nuanced questions that you're kind of interested in as Chris jumps in for the next 15 minutes or so. We're not going to send you to a breakout room after this. Okay, I repeat, we are not going to send you to a breakout room after this. So what we want you to do is we want you to ask questions while he's showing this so that we can move directly on to the more production-oriented piece of today and of this week, all right? So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to the wizard for the demo. Yes. Okay. So, uh, as great, hopefully you can see my, uh, my screen, the, the, the idea today is to go a little bit deeper into actual, uh, chain lit, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, worrying so much about the, the app surrounding it. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about, uh, the nuts and bolts of what chain lit's doing and, some patterns that we can use and leverage that uh, that will help us to understand, you know, what what we need to think about or take advantage of when we're building a more robust application. So, first things first, uh, we're you know we're in uh, Chainlet app.py. So just like uh, similar frameworks, app.py is kind of where the magic happens, right? This is where we uh, we instantiate the application from. This is where we define what it can do and when it does it. The first thing we're going to see is this uh, wrapper. So this is the uh, chainlet decorator. Um, decorators are a pattern in Python that uh, really simplify our workflows. You can think of it as a uh, function that hides in this at symbol. So this the decorator will decorate the uh, the function with another function uh, that's going to do all kinds of powerful stuff, but uh, the main point is that it's going to take our init function. The reason that's such a powerful pattern is because you can do all kinds of super fun things with it. Uh, you can, you know, build simple decorators yourself, or you can build a framework that's used through a decorator. So. We're going to use this Langchain Factory uh, decorator. This is from a, uh, a specific version of Chainlet. The versions of Chainlet are evolving extremely fast, uh, but the idea is we want to uh, just kind of lock in and, and talk about these patterns here. The second thing we're going to talk about is this idea of async. So async is a very specific term in Python, uh, but it extends to basically web development uh, in general. So the idea is we don't want to have to wait for stuff, right? So the the idea of asynchronous uh, applications is that we are we're not we're not held by uh, you know waiting for something to finish and then doing the next thing. So the reason this is important is, Say you wanted to make a call to a API and you waited for, you know, a thousand, uh, a thousand queries to finish, right? So we start from the top, we go to the bottom. If we have to wait for every one of those to finish before we send the next one, it's going to take forever, right? The idea is we we want to have a way to do that a little bit smarter and that's where async comes in so what we instead do is we send out a bunch of requests say a thousand and then we wait for them to come in 
as they come in. So we don't wait for one to finish before sending the next one. Hopefully, uh, you know, you can you can see the application of of this rather quickly. Uh, right. The idea being, if we have a model endpoint, which you're going to look at next, uh, you know, we have a model endpoint that can take and receive queries. The idea is instead of waiting for each query to finish, we can send a bunch of queries all at once and then uh, collect them at the end. So uh, I'm going to pause there for a second because I know async is a, something we've gotten a few questions on. So if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Otherwise, we're going to continue through the, the chainlet flow. Christos. Yeah, uh, I was hoping you can explain. So when you have a async function and then inside that function, you have uh, an await, let's say you're um, you're calling, a, uh, calling another function inside of it and setting it to a variable. What's what's the process for synchronous for an asynchronous call setting? Does it does it run through that function and do those operations? And then the one the one the ace the uh, the await the await calls are just don't have don't have um, a value yet. And then everything else runs, and then the whole function is done. And then maybe it maybe it um, fills out or not. And then how does how does how does that work exactly with 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 the with the rules of async? So the the, the what you're talking about is like blocking versus not blocking. So synchronous communication is what you would consider blocking. Asynchronous is non-blocking. The idea of async and synchronous working together is that we kind of have two different uh, uh, two different ideas, right? So the our await is like an asynchronous return. Uh, you know, you can you can think of it that way. The having synchronous components inside an asynchronous call is still fine you're most of the time going to have that, right? You're calling something and something has to do work and that's going to take time. Um, but the idea is that we want to be able to initiate many of these calls at once and then collect the results at the end. So we get a promise from uh, an asynchronous uh, function, which is it, it's going to do the thing, right? Uh, we, we, we receive information. Hey, I got the request and I'm going to do it. And we're going to see a more explicit implementation of this when we talk about deploying uh, Llama 2 later, which is through that, uh, you know, that idea of a, we get a task ID and then we collect the response from the task ID. But the base idea here is that synchronous communication inside the asynchronous call is fine, but it is going to be blocking. That means for each of those calls, it's going to wait until it's done to return. But as long as we can send many of those off, we don't have to wait so long for the, the official response. So when we're talking about like an outside API, right, we're never going to hit blocking in inside our, our program. If we asynchronously call OpenAI, our program never has to stop and think to do a task and then can carry on, right? Uh, OpenAPI sure does, but we don't have to. And that can be important in terms of uh, how we want to process or handle the the return response. I know that's quite a lot of words, but it's a critical pattern that uh, that can be a little bit confusing. So, uh, Raul. Yeah, my I think my main difficulty um, from last homework, I can say, uh, the least, was like um, the data transformations to SQL because we were dealing with files and with files, I think I'm fine with it. You put up in a vector store and so, right? When you have to transform that data, right? Into a different format, how would that be translated right into the, to the production quality grade, like uh, into an app, right? Uh, do, you mind, do you mind expanding on that a little bit? Expand, it will be like, a, so what we do in the notebook was like, uh, we have the CSV files, we make them uh, data frames from pandas, right? 
Yeah. And then we create the the, the SQL uh, database, right? Yeah. And we make the transformation to store everything there in a SQL fashion, right? Yeah. Um, so we have that will have to be entirely repeated. That was like uh, my kind of like I I I didn't get this like uh, you know a shortcut when putting up in an app, right? That yeah. Was like so the idea there is I mean, there are some things that just are going to be blocking. So like uh, that 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 creation of the index, we have to wait for it to be done. Right, like that's the that's a that's a fact. Uh, when we're creating our initial indices, there's nothing to do but wait. Um, we we don't have the ability to start querying it until it's done. So, you know, we're just forced to do that in a synchronous fashion. Uh, the idea is that yeah, so that's what uh, Bikram just mentioned as well. What if one thing depends on the other? That's exactly what we're talking about now, right? Like, um, the in the index is blocking we need to do it before we can do the, the rest of the application and so there's not a graceful way to handle that asynchronously what there is a graceful way to handle is when we're creating the index inside of the index creation when we're doing say a thousand embedded queries all at once we want to be able to send you know uh, say a hundred at a time and then collect them in groups of 100 and that for the most part is handled by the application and so when we're looking at the uh, components of Langchain that allow us to do these things asynchronously, uh, we we can wrap them in that asynchronous uh, make async function, say, for instance, where we're able to uh, leverage the fact that we have an asynchronous implementation of that uh, specific task. Hopefully that answered your question. If it didn't, many apologies. Uh, Jay. I was just going to add on... Um... If your task of building an index produces something that's archivable so that it doesn't take a long time the next time, then you can use that as a shortcut. So an example might be the first time you build an index, you might fine tune a model. And normal, I don't think you'd normally do that in the indexing process, but you might create a, a model with an identifier and you wouldn't want to keep doing that every time you reload the hugging face page, for example. So you would keep track of that identifier as the archive net result of your indexing and then just use that further down the road. So in, in Rolo's example, that SQL database kind of lives in memory, but if it were archived and stored somewhere so it was accessible down the road, then you wouldn't have to recreate it. Yes, correct. So, uh, you know, another way to think about that is if we only need to do the thing once in the case of the index, right, we can uh, the next time rely on the fact that it's already built. Uh, this is why things like Pinecone are so popular right now. Pinecone lets us do that very well because we create the index and then it just sits waiting for us to ping it on some random server, right? And so once it's already created, we no longer have that blocking task. We don't need to create the index, so we don't need to spend 40 minutes waiting for it to embed all of our 1 million uh, you know, embedding sequences. But the first time we do it, yes, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be rather slow. Um, and that's why in the other uh, assignments, you should see logic that checks for the existence of a cached embedding or vector store and then loads it from mem or from disk as opposed to trying to re-index it. Uh, the load from disk is still slow, but it is faster <laughs> than re-indexing your, your 20, 40, 50, 60 documents, you know, so great so question. Just so. making sure if I get it, it's like, so you, you, you build, you do all those transformation and have everything ready and uh, to lighten up the, the, you know, the yes. weight to the application in production, right? Correct. That's pretty much it, right? And you use only to retrieve information directly from, this already transform uh, uh, schema, if you if you say right. Yeah. So the yes, any time that you're building an application, you will want to go ahead and do as much work beforehand as you can. Uh, that does not mean that you have you always have the power to do that, of course, but it does mean that you very much want to. Um, 
you know, be able to do as much pre-processing, let's call it, as humanly possible. Um, this is a huge part of LLM application building. And part of the reason why uh, when we talk on Thursday, tools like, uh, you know, weights and biases can be incredibly helpful in terms of managing our prompts or doing prompt engineering uh, and in terms of caching, right? Like caching is, uh, you if you have an application that doesn't use caching, right? Versus one that does, you're going to save yourself seconds and dollars uh, every every day, right? The idea of and this is why in the first the first time we talked about uh, uh, Chainlet and uh, you know we can go through those examples in more detail in office hours or, or or later on, but the idea of caching your embeddings is so powerful because, like Jay was saying, if we have just this place where we're storing in memory or on disk a bunch of uh, embeddings, we never have to go to the API anymore, right? If we don't have to go to the API, we don't have to pay money. We don't have to go to the API, we save time, right? Like loading the embedding from cache on disk takes like, uh, you know, 0.01 seconds, getting it from OpenAI just on travel time alone, you're exceeding that, right? So the idea is that these kinds, anything you can do, um, anything that you can cache, you, you should cache. And this is, we we had a good, uh, we had some good questions uh, before about, you know, caching the actual responses as well. And yes, the same thing. If we can cache our actual responses, we're going to save money. We're going to save everything. Yeah. Great questions though. Great questions. Uh, okay. I will carry on. And uh, we are going to go ahead and uh, just talk briefly about what the actual app's doing. We're going to load. Uh, that's all you need to do. This is just basically using the archive uh, API to grab the uh, to grab the documents we need. We're going to grab a number of uh, of archive papers. So we're going to search for a term. And then grab a number of papers. We're going to grab the top three um, from our uh, API. And again, we we have this asynchronous uh, flow, which is where we're saying, you know, hey, just send send this query out. Don't uh, don't worry about it. But it is wrapped in something that's blocking. So this is more for uh, if you're going to do like uh, a lot of archive requests, right? Then we will send a message when we're done that. We will also uh, just parse through our document very quickly. Um, the idea here is, again, because this is on the same machine, this is going to be blocking. So this is going to take time for our machine to do. We are not going to be able to do other stuff while we are doing this. Um, and then we will create our embeddings. We will grab our embeddings from OpenAI. And then we will set up our chain. And then we will uh, get our chain and return it to our user. Now we technically we're not returning it to the user. We're, we're returning it to the user session and the user session is going to keep track of our chain for us so that we can use it in this post process function. The idea again of chainlet is fairly straightforward. We have this uh, interface, right? Where, which has these, this kind of front end looking experience. And this has our uh, messages. It has a history. It has the ability to send messages and it displays messages. These decorators are associated with different points in our application's lifetime. So just like in Fast API, right, you, you have when you are starting the application, this is when our LangChain factory is going to, going to trigger, or the decorator for newer versions of Chainlet uh, are on, uh, on chat start, which is a flow that we've seen before in the, uh, yeah. The idea as well is for our LangChain post process, this is what's going to happen after our chain has done work. So the user is going to send a message, the message is going to get a response, and then LangChain's uh, going to return that response, but we're going to intercept it with this LangChain post process and do some formatting uh, in order to make our application look a little bit, uh, or our results look a little bit different. But the idea here is that these are happening in different parts of our program's lifetime. So when we're getting a message or we're receiving a message, or we're sending a message, 
uh, these are the ways that we can interface with these decorators. Um, they're very well named, you know, uh, in newer versions, like we've, we've seen, they also have things like on, on message, on chat. There you go. Uh, yes. Okay. But that's the idea. This is the idea of Chainlet. Uh, you know, we, we have these decorators, they decorate functions that help us do stuff. And the idea is at the end of the day, we have this application where all of these things that are happening are happening by themselves. Uh, they don't require us to, um, they don't require us to do anything, right? This is all just happening for us. And then these instances where we get a response from our, uh, our application is where we're going to step in and perform some task. So in this case, if we go back to our application, we have our post process, we grab our answer, and then we are going to fill out some sources for our answer. And then we are going to merge those sources based on the page not, or document, just so we can display it more, more beautifully. And then we're going to inject uh, some information into the Langchain response. And so using that flow, we get this response. Instead of just this text, we get this re this text plus this uh, QLOR efficient fine tuning of quantized, quantized LLMs, which includes the ability to click the link and see the exact source and also see the page numbers that our LLM used to determine the response. So this is the idea of Chainlet. It's, it's going to do all this chat stuff by itself, but we're able to step in at different points of the program and make modifications on how the uh, the output is parsed or sent around or what happens to it. Uh, Bowen, what's up? Yes, so uh, I tried to replicate something in Streamlit before. Uh, so what I found is uh, it answers the first question pretty well. But if you ask another question, it, it starts to answer the question, even though like the second question could be like unrelated, it, it's gonna answer, try to answer within the first question concept. So I wasn't sure if this demo would have the same problem if you ask another question, even though, even if it's about the same paper, uh, just some other different questions that's kind of unrelated, is, is it gonna, is it gonna go uh, blow up? So in, in the case of uh, continuing to chat is a, you know, we, we have the ability to do that. It still has that index that we created initially with our paper. Uh, mm -hmm. So we can continue conversation about that uh, that paper, absolutely. And you're saying if we ask like an unrelated question, what, what happens? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So it still is being forced to give a source, but I, I think it, it actually answered pretty well. Yeah. So this is, and that's just like the logic of the application, right? If we have uh, okay. no response, then there you go. But the, the idea is that we're getting the paper that it's looking at and uh, we could look this, look at this paper and, probably find that it did not mention the gravitational constant. Mm. Uh, it's one of those things where we we always want to return a source, even if the source is, we didn't find that stuff in the source buzz, but, you know, we, we still want to see that. So Deepak, oh. what's up? Here, uh, Chris, my question is regarding Chainlit. Uh, is Chainlit basically just to create a chat GPT type, type yes. GUI? You 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 can't make any difference, any changes to the look and feel of the GUI, right? In the chain blend? You can make some superficial different changes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You can yeah, uh, but, but yeah. no, the, the flow is being entirely handled through uh through Chainlet. This is just a uh an interface that we're using for our application. So this API is just basically just for playing around, right? N nothing I, you know, unless until uh Nothing production quality kind of app would be using something like this, right? Um, well, you'd be surprised, uh, but uh, yes, the idea is 
that we we aren't using this for our production application. We can. Uh, there's no reason that you don't that you shouldn't. Yeah, um, uh, unless but, until the application is exactly chat GPT type, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. If it is something else, or if you want to do something else, then you know yeah. it would work, right? Um, the, the benefit of Chainlet over some of the other tools that we could talk about that help us interface with our LLM. Number one, we always want to interface with our LLM to see how it does uh, in order to be able to, to experiment with it. Number two, the idea of Chainlet is that it offers us this very straightforward uh, you know, step through ability so we can see what our different chains are doing, what their responses are, uh, right. wh what hits open API and what literal request hits open API or your LLM in this case, right? So uh, this is this is somewhere where we can um, this is somewhere where we have the ability to uh, you know change the prompt. So doing right. prompt engineering, right? We can do that in this step, uh, getting working on the ability to get better and better results through uh, through Chainlet. So Chainlet is a uh, primarily a testing and debugging tool. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. yep. Uh, Raul, what's up? Yeah, just like uh, maybe to share uh, regarding Streamlit, what Bo Bo asked. If the way I see. Chainlit is more optimizing to a chat format, right? If you want to do the same with Streamlit, you have to do a lot of workarounds with like prompt engineering. So to add the entire history of like uh, in a append everything to throw as uh, in a new in a sort of like a new question to the LLM and get sort of like <laughs> so this flow is handled the way I see like easier in Chainlit. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, but I, I, it has like this trade off on the nature of like uh, the way you want to put the UI, right? Which I yes. think I didn't get uh, to the second homework of last week. To do the auto training in like uh, for me it was kind of confusing how to put that up, you know. Um, in Chainlit, I would say, like, I, I would do way easier maybe in Streamlit or Gradio, or, you know, which is, like, seems to be more uh, flexible in this sense. Yeah, I mean, the the choice of front end is totally up to you. Uh, but the, the idea is that, yes, you want to use whatever tools you're most comfortable with. I would recommend Chainlet because it's a way to get your entire team um, and everybody else into it. And that's the way to go. Yeah. Chris, uh, if I can come in. Yeah. Uh, if you, if you like, you know, um, uh, Langchain allows you to build a very complex kind of agents, right? And, and if you have those agents in there, right? Can chain chainlet handle those uh, like you know um, use cases? Specify right. the use cases a little bit clearer. Sorry, Deepak. Like, let, let's say, for example, you want to uh, query a database, right, um, um, and and present that in in a grid format on the screen. Would, would chainlet have? Does chainlet have that capability? Yeah, definitely. It's it's all markdown, so you could create a markdown table and append that as the part of the out, output if you wanted to. Um, it yeah. has. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Definitely. Okay. Kumar. Which is more than what Chad what Chad GPT can do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Uh, let's have a customer who has a website already and and has chat functionality built into it. They they really don't want a whole new chainlit application. Um, yep. How do I go about? How do I go about building this whole app not the ui and passing it on to that website is it through api calls then how do i deploy the non-chain lit portion of the whole llm ops so if you're asking questions about how we would deploy say a open source model uh then uh, have we got have we got some information for you coming up Coming up next, uh, you know, the, wow. the the truth is that the model hosting and model stack is 
almost exactly traditional ML, MLOps, right? Like that is where MLOps fits in. It is a, uh, it's definitely something that we've received feedback it is exciting and you guys are pumped about. So we want to be able to show it to you, but um, it is, that is traditional MLOps through and through. The LLMOps stack is tools like uh, Chainlet, tools like we'll see on, um, uh, on Thursday, excuse me, Thursday, like weights and biases for prompts, um, you know, the, these vector stores, uh, Lang chain, those are the, the kind of LLM ops, um, tools, you know, uh, but the idea is that we have, we still, it's still great to get a refresher about some, some, uh, you know, ML ops and how we might have these models scale a little bit harder than they might out of the box. Uh, we're going to look at some straightforward uh, solutions today uh, that some of you have uh, have seen but uh, you know we want to uh, just start and get everybody up to the same speed on that that classic MLOps stack but great question Kumar yes okay and that's that's I took up more of your time than I should have uh, Greg many apologies but uh, a lot of good questions, and uh, the idea is that we want to be able to have this application that we, you know, can understand a little bit better what's actually going on behind the scenes and and why it's useful to us and and how we can leverage it to, uh, to be better at our our uh, LLM kind of production. Sweet. All right. Well, uh, we're gonna keep it moving here and. We're going to go from this POC idea, all right? And then what we're going to show today is about getting it production ready, exactly to your point, Kumar. And we're actually going to build out this piece of it today because we are always so limited on time in our brief two hours together. So what we're going to do is we're going to build it out like this today, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to show you, okay, Yes, you can build the POC. And yeah, it's pretty straightforward to build the POC. And you know, one of the things that we should all be able to do is whip up a quick quick POC for our boss, for our customer, for whoever. But let's say it gets serious. Let's say you get a bunch of users. Let's say you need to do a bunch of back-end development for a customer instead, and they don't really care about the front end. You've dialed everything in and you want to you want to get this thing basically deployed to production. Okay. So we're going to build with three super simple components today. So we're not even going to really like worry about all of the Langchain archive stuff that we, or any of the Chainlet stuff right now, because it's it gets very, very confusing quickly for those of you that don't have experience with the more traditional ML ops. So this is sort of a quick debrief on everything you need to know to get Llama 2 deployed on AWS using fast API and Docker. Okay, so for those of you that already know this stuff, Cold, enjoy the first principles review, okay? Uh, that's what I want you guys to do. All right, so um, we're going to use Llama 2 because, I mean, what other freaking model would you pick ever right now if you wanted to go impress somebody with your deployment? Obviously, pick Llama 2. It's out there leading the way. Um, it's the biggest, baddest model uh, around. So, you know, obviously, let's scoop that one up. All right. So Llama 2, we'll talk about benchmarks and we'll talk about this leaderboard and we'll talk about RAG evaluation more on Thursday. But for today, we're building deployment stuff. And the first piece of this deployment puzzle is the web application framework called Fast API. So this is the application framework for you guys to learn. It's the web app framework for building APIs in Python. Most of you know only just a few languages and the primary language is Python. We're always doing stuff in Python today and that's kind of just the nature of the beast in AI. Now, it's worth noting a couple of these social proof things from the Fast API website, one of which I really liked. I think you'll like this one, Chris, if you haven't seen it before. Uh, we adopted the Fast API library to spawn a REST server that can be queried to obtain predictions for the tool Ludwig built at Uber by Piero Molina, Piero Molino. And Piero is actually doing a deep learning event for his company Predabase. So Piero actually left Uber, left for a year, worked at Stanford, 
and then started a new company based on this open source tool, Ludwig, that he created initially using Fast API while he was at Uber. And now Ludwig's crushing it. And they're doing all sorts of declarative uh, ML and declarative LLM stuff. And they're doing a big deep learning event, I believe, later this week. So uh, very cool to see sort of, again, this very small community of people that are working kind of out at the edge here. But a lot of people using Fast API, some of the biggest names out there. Um, and so the question is like, well, like why? Well, why are people picking this one up? Aren't there other ones? Yeah, there are other ones. And in fact, we did a few events on Fast API when under sort of the fourth brain and deep learning banners last year that you may have seen. And you know, when we did this last year, we said, well, Fast API is definitely one of the fastest growing. And you can kind of see it. It wasn't cr quite crushing it against Total Stars, Flask, and Django. And then today I checked. And it's getting there. It's getting there. It's still, I would say, the fastest growing. Uh, but these are kind of entrenched competitors, and they're not growing very fast anymore. Um, and just most of all, you know, we we every time we ask a bunch of people if we have thousand or two thousand people in the room, they're all saying mostly fast API. And we actually did a few different events where we went deep on this. And so you, you, you're going to have access to, to all of that. We're going to tell you about that in just a little bit. But the main thing with Fast API that's so nice that people love the most every time we talk about it with anybody is they love the docs, okay? And when I ask the creator of Fast API what people love the most, he says the docs because it just creates docs really nicely, really super straightforwardly and allows you to interact in a GUI-like way with Fast API just using this docs approach. And we're gonna show you how to do this today. And this is kind of what it looks like. You can kind of interact with it, not, not in a beautiful chainlet way, but in more of a GUI based way than you can just simply using the command line and just simply using VS Code. So this Swagger UI is really the thing that stands out amongst web app frameworks. Uh, but it also, it's, uh, it's fast. So, you know, that's another thing. And it basically, is getting a lot of benchmark, you know, love versus other frameworks. Uh, it's got a number of other things going as well. Um, Chris will talk about these as he goes through the demo shortly, but a couple of things I wanna kind of point out to you that'll start making more sense in the context of today's discussion. Uh, one of the reasons why it's fast is, is because it uses a UV corn server and it uses an ASCII server. Now what's an ASCII server? It's an asynchronous server gateway interface. So this idea of synchronous asynchronous is coming back up here. And it's really uh, meant to provide a standard interface between async capable Python web servers, frameworks and applications. So this is like, you know, again, we're kind of getting down in the weeds here and we don't want to go like, what is a server 101? But we know a lot of you don't have the same background that uh, some of you do. So um, another thing to, to sort of point out here is the open API. This is not open AI. This is the open API um, specification. It sort of just defines a sort of standard programming agnostic, programming language agnostic way for interacting with sort of HTTP APIs, all right? So this is sort of very open. It's very standardized. It's gonna use the same type of decorators that you saw used in Chainlet. And it's gonna really allow us to sort of connect that Chainlet piece to this Fast API piece. And we're kind of learning from the front end. Now, all of this stuff, you can see Sebastian, this is the creator, most epic stash in the biz, in a great guy, overall great guy. Um, he did an event with us. That was really cool. And then Chris also did an event with a former instructor where he was crushing it on this stuff. You can rewatch it a thousand times. Um, and, uh, those are all available on YouTube on the deep learning live channel. All right. So fast API, we're going to go into it, but Docker is the other piece for those of you that don't know about Docker. Here's just a quick primer on like containers. This is how you want to work. And this is how Docker lets you work. Okay, that's it, we're done. No, I'm just kidding. We're gonna sort of piece this together bottom up. Like, this is how you wanna work. You wanna build the app and you wanna have the requirements, that TXT file. And then you wanna not really worry about the other stuff. Even though everybody's like, no, we wanna worry about the other stuff. We wanna put it in prod, put it in prod. Put it in. That's what we're gonna show you today. But a container allows us to do this in a really straightforward way. Because when you do this on your computer, it sort of looks like this. 
and you're sort of doing this on your own hardware, on your own OS. And what you can do is you could like, you know, build your own server and be like Todd, right? You could do that. And you could like basically have a setup that kind of looks like this and you might call it, you know, I'm on bare metal, I'm on a bare metal server. And you're sort of like doing this all, you know, on some other hardware, not, not, and it's not, maybe it's your hardware, maybe it's in your garage, right? But maybe it's also, maybe it's also like AWS's hardware. Maybe it's also GCP's hardware. Maybe it's also one of these big cloud providers providing you with this bare metal server. But this is very like, to connect all these things together is crazy. We don't do that because it doesn't make sense to work at that layer of abstraction. So this idea of a virtual machine that is more likely to be what you use on AWS, on GCP, on Azure, this is what this is what it kind of looks like. Your virtual machine is going to have your baseline OS. Generally, it's going to be some sort of Linux OS like Ubuntu or something. And you're going to be able to put your little app on that OS. And you could spin up as many virtual machines as you want. You just have to pay for them. And they get expensive if you spin up a bunch of them um, really, really quickly. So Kubernetes, be careful spinning up Kubernetes clusters if you don't need them. Um, the virtual machine piece is what you have to sort of spin up or what the service that is a managed service within AWS, let's say, has to spin up for you, okay? But where you want to work is you want to work in the container. And in the container, that's that's what it's all about. It's just, you know, how can I just put it in a little box that I can put on any OS, right? And so you're basically wanting to just work at this same level of abstraction that you started working at. That's sort of the idea of the container for us. And then obviously, if you have many containers, like think of a container ship, you just put many, many, many different containers on one big ship. And then that's Kubernetes, right? So you can just and you can do all these crazy things with managing containers. And you know, then you get into the ELK stack. And this is just sort of classic MLOps, DevOps stuff. All right. We're not going to go super deep into that. But if you want more of that, let us know. Let us know. Okay. Um, we can definitely we can definitely come up with some stuff. All right. So this is sort of the idea: virtual machines, containers, bare metal servers. Um, this is kind of where we are. All right. So Where's Docker fit in with all this? Well, Docker is like the freaking container thing to know. It's like fast API. It's like the thing. Here, you want one thing? Here's the thing. This one's even more clear than fast API. And you know, it's it's this just allows you to build locally and then ship and share globally at scale. All right. So that's the idea. Build locally ship globally and at scale. All right, so that's what we want with containers. All right, so what does Docker look like fundamentally? Well, you might hear a couple of things as you come across Docker. Uh, it uses a client server architecture. And what it's going to allow you to do is it's going to allow you to interact with the daemon, the Docker daemon. You'll hear about the Docker daemon as you kind of get into this. And you'll like you'll see the Docker daemon working on stuff for you as you start building containers and stuff. But what it allows you to sort of do is it allows you to kind of build these containers through the use of what are called images. All right. So you're the client and you're sort of doing stuff in your terminal and you're sort of building up images. Those sort of form the basis for containers. All right. And then and you kind of keep everything in one place and, you know, you're sort of able to keep going with building more images, pulling more images, building more containers, uh, and then sort of the next layer of abstraction is the Kubernetes layer. So, you know, as the client, what you're going to do is you're going to do things like Docker run, Docker build, Docker pull, Docker compose. If you came to one of the build sessions recently, we use Docker compose. And so the, the client and the daemon, they just talk with, through a simple REST API. And that's kind of you know, the way this works, they can be sort of separated completely. They're just sort of connected through any, any old REST API that they can be, you know, in the same place, they can be different places, they can be hosted on different servers. It doesn't really matter. Um, 
And so there's a, just a lot of flexibility built into this. And so what we want to do is we want to understand that like the image is the key thing. And so like when we think about the image, the image is just this read only piece of information that allows you to create a container. A lot of times you're finding pre-built images, you're finding like, you know, other people figured out this Docker problem that you have many, many times. And actually the GUI based way to find these images is what's called the Docker hub. And so the Docker hub, you can, you can access through Docker desktop, which is really nice. In fact, I would recommend everybody just leveraging Docker desktop. It's uh, pretty straightforward to use. And um, but really what you're doing with these images is you're, you're building up this container and you're doing this through the use of a Docker file. And the Docker file has a very simple syntax where you might notice, you know, hey, like, okay, we're just, we're pulling Python down because we're doing stuff in Python. We're gonna set a working directory. None of this is very complicated or difficult. And then look at that. We want our app, we want our dependencies. We got our requirements TXT and we install them. And then we actually are just copying over our app code in whatever repo, you know, whatever folder we have. Maybe it's called app, maybe it's called source. And then we're just exposing a port. Generally it's like port 8,000, port 8080. And we're, we're simply, every time you see CMD, we're simply running a command line uh, command that allows us to run the app. So the Docker container is super straightforward. This is the Docker file format. And so anytime you use Docker, some of you have been using it already on your assignments, like shout out to Raul, but many of you have not, and that's fine, but you can use it very easily. And it's a good habit to get into to just use Docker for as much as uh, you can, because again, build locally, ship and share globally and at scale. So the registries are very simple. They just allow you to hold stuff in them, store images, and you can pull those images you can build new containers with them, but the images are the main artifact that you're basically able to build containers with, all right? And what you're gonna be able to do is you're gonna be able to pull containers, push contain or pull images, push images, and you're gonna be able to then build containers with whatever images you want. All right, so build is converting the container to, uh, or the image to the, is, is actually, no, let me say that right, build, is building, Chris, what is, is build building the image or the container? Build is building the image uh, building that the, image. the that the run command can use to build the container. So That's the, right. the idea is, yeah, exactly. So Docker build is like setting, it's like uh, you're building the exact blue, so Docker file, is the blueprints, right? That's how we we think about building a house or whatever like that, right? If we want to use this analogy, uh, Docker file is the, I think probably I, if I walk through the the application we have, I'll share my screen and can we can talk about this a little bit uh, more in, in depth. So I'm gonna do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, we will, uh, we'll be doing that in just a second. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so no problem. And we're just about ready. We're just about done with this Docker idea. But yeah, so these arrows sort of tell the whole story. Run allows you to run images into containers. Build allows the daemon to sort of help you build images and you can pull directly from registries. All right. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to sort of combine this Docker architecture with the AWS Elastic Container Service. So what we're gonna do is it's gonna be really nice because we're just gonna be able to get on AWS, show it a container and bada bing, bada boom, get our thing into production. We actually aren't even gonna use any of these tools. It's even simpler than that, that you see here on deployments and scaling. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and at that point, we're gonna give it just a couple minutes here uh, for a quick break because we're at that break time. So let's take like, let's take like four minutes um, and then Chris will get started with the demo at 8.07, 8.08. We'll get started at 8.08. Um, and so give us about four minutes and we'll get started with the demo 
on how to actually deploy Llama 2 to production. All right, thank you, everybody. Let's see if I can, four minutes. Llama 2. Hello, my name is Chris. Uh, so yeah, the idea here, some of you might have seen this uh, from our build session, but this is the idea of how we actually want to get our model in a place that is productionalizable. There are a number of approaches you can take here. There are a number of built-in services. There are a number of everything, but this is the uh, most straightforward way that we can walk through and explain what we really mean when we're talking about scalable versus anything else. So we're going to start with our blueprint, which is our Docker compose file. Now, what Greg was talking about before is fantastic. And that is the idea of these different containers and all of these containers have blueprints. Um, one of the limitations of that though, is that the blueprint, each, each, each blueprint is for a box, right? For a specific thing or application part. And what that can lead to is a situation where we don't, let's say we know some parts of our application are going to be very resource heavy. And we know that other parts are going to be like nothing, right? So they, they're just calling APIs and living and loving life, right? This is where the idea of Docker Compose can come in handy. Uh, Docker Compose is a way to spin up multiple containers at a time, uh, all in the same command. So the idea is we want to, uh, you know, yes, the idea is we want to be able to spin up a number of different services all at once and tear them down together and define how they interact with each other. So the in essence what we're doing is we're building a number of services and we're labeling these services at the first indentation level our docker compose is just a yaml so the indentation levels are very critical the idea here is that we have our service called web that's going to be our web interface so how we actually interact with our app uh, you know this is going to have things like fast api as you can probably see uh, if you were paying attention earlier, this pattern uh, is kind of reminiscent of. Then we have our worker. Now, the worker, unsurprisingly, does a lot of work, right? So it is, I'm sorry, it is the the idea of the worker is that it's it's doing the actual compute. It's doing the big boy calculations. It's the one that has Llama 2. It's the one that runs the model. And we're going to use this service called Celery in order to help us. When we're talking about something like fast API, or we're talking about something like scalable, right? What we really want to, what we really want to say is how do we, how do we dynamically provide resources to the correct number of things and handle many, 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 many requests? Um, so we're going to walk through kind of the shape of the application and then we'll come back to this Docker compose file, but you can think of it as it is, it is a composer, right? It's composing an application for us through everyone's favorite format, YAML. Um, we also have the, uh, uh, sorry, one second. Uh, we also have our Docker file, which is a blueprint. This is the thing that's going to help us set up a particular container and that's going to be for fast api so fast api is how we're going to interface with our model right we want to be able to send requests and get responses and we want to use a uh, super standard format to do that uh, we want to be able to send http requests and get responses in an expected and universal format and so we'll look at our uh, actual fast API application, which is super, super straightforward, right? We have the app. We have a pydantic class, which is just uh, indicating that this thing is supposed to be a string called prompt. And then we have generate text. And then we have task ID. Now, this is a little bit uh, over or over engineered for this particular task. We're only using one GPU. We're probably not going to send a lot of requests, but the idea is this is the pattern we want to think about. 
which is that our fast API is isn't it's not doing anything other than it's getting task IDs and it's checking on the how those task IDs are going along, right? So we have our task IDs and then we have the ability to check how they're doing. Um, that's all fast API is used for here. We, we don't need it for anything else, right? When we're connecting these two, which is going to be the, 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 the task that you have, uh, we want to connect this into our LLM slot in Chainlet, right? We want to have Chainlet reach out to fast API with some text, get a response, and then Bob's your uncle, right? So that this is how we're, we're, we're thinking about the application structure. This is the interface to the model. Let's go to the other component. So when we send a request to fast API, go back to the app.py for a second, you'll see that we're we're generating this text task, right? We are we are we are generating a task. So what is a task and what does it mean? Well, we're going to be using celery, which is going to be our worker, and celery is going to accept tasks and then work on them, right? Super straightforward. We're going to put a layer in between the two of them called a task queue, which we're going to handle through our uh, uh, our Redis container. Redis is just a super lightweight, uh, you know, messaging system. You know, it, it's great. It's going to hold tasks and their statuses. And we're going to call that a backend and a broker. You don't have to... Th worry too much about this, the specific terms here, but the idea is that in front of our actual workhorse, right in front of the actual guy doing all the work, we have a uh, another service that sits there and it accepts tasks and then it waits to see which workers it can assign tasks to and then it gets the responses when they're completed. And that is what the, that's all that we're using Redis for is that task queue. That is what adds our scalability. Right. So if we had our celery set up on, say, a cluster of GPUs that we had uh, set up through Amazon to dynamically spin up and down based on load. Right. What we'd be able to do is say, hey, celery, you have access to up to eight GPUs. Right. But it might not need them all the time when it does need them. It's going to be able to spin them up. In this case, we're, we're leaving it on one GPU just because cost will be prohibitive and everything else. But the idea here is that celery is going to expand to the size we let it. So it's going to generate workers up to a specific limit. We are hard locking the number of workers for this instance, just to one. So there's only ever one worker. But again, that's a, this is a cost issue, right? It's going to be expensive if you let it expand out. Uh, don't want anyone to wind up with $7,000 uh, worth of Amazon charges. But this is the pattern, right? We're focused on the pattern, not the, the specific example. So again, we'll go back to our um, we'll go back to our, our Docker Compose file and uh, we'll, we'll look at the Redis server really quickly. It's it's nothing special. We just started up. So there you go. Very, very stoked. So we go back to our uh, Docker Compose.yaml and we see again our services. We have our web, which is fast API. We have our worker, which is celery. And we have our Redis, uh, which is just going to be a, a task queue or messaging queue. So the idea is we ask the web server to do some uh, generation. The web server sends that to our uh, our Celery broker, which is going to be Redis, which is going to say, hey, I have a new task. It's going to wait for an available worker. It's going to pass it off to a worker and on and on. Let's say we had 1,000 workers and we had 2,000 requests. We would get all 2,000 requests. Redis would hold those in order received. It would pass the first 1,000 to the first 1,000 workers. As those workers completed their tasks, they would update the Redis queue saying, actually, this task is done and here's the response. Then it would get the next task in the queue assigned to it and repeat that forever, right? So you can see that's where our scalability comes in. Now, there's a specific... There's two kinds of scaling that we have in these applications, which is vertical and horizontal scaling. Uh, this this particular uh, version is going to be very good at horizontal scaling. Um, and that's just something that you can hear. There you go. Uh, the idea, though, is that we're not 
needing to create new applications. We're not, or sorry, uh, vertical scaling. We're not needing to create new applications. We're just getting, le we're leveraging the resources that we have. If we wanted to do this even better, and a lot of people abide by this uh, approach, uh, just scale horizontally forever. When you run out of resources, add more machines, right? That's the one way you can do it. We're not going to look at that specific example because, again, machines are super expensive. Um, we we don't want to be adding new machines uh, in our our applications. We want to try to be as clever as we can, and Celery is a way to do that. Um, the thing that this will help with a ton is if you're out of workers, if you have no workers, and people hit your API, instead of saying, sorry, bro, no resources, uh, it just takes a while. And that's the that's the beauty of things like uh, this this particular application flow. If you have 10,000 requests, you'll get them done. It might take a long time, but you'll get all 10,000 of those suckers done. And uh, that's kind of the, the the benefit of this framework. So um, I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to be to to drown you guys in info. Uh, so I'm gonna pause for questions and uh, you know any anything that you want to ask, go go for it. Uh, I do want to leave some time for us to 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 have the breakout room. So, um, but yes. Oh, okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. It's me again. So, um, I so so the thing is that this pattern I've seen it. I played around with it. I I just wasn't entirely sure like how clients would use it because you can't really keep asking clients to do like a two step. Right? Like it, it, the first time it, when you call the API, it actually is a generate a task. It actually just generate a task ID, and then. I think there got to be a way to just automatically fetch the ready tasks to go to the downstream, right? So like if we were to build the API for some kind of a customer, even though there's a, a lot of people in there, uh, it has to be served to automatically to someone else, right? So we, you can't keep asking people to make two requests. You, unfortunately you can and must. Uh, when, when you say ask people though, really what you're saying is, make the front end do it right yes. so, it's like the, yeah. the downstream user they're gonna do a two step no just one step for the downstream user we want to we want to build an application so when you're connecting chainlet and this the, the mm -hmm. major puzzle puzzle that you guys have the major like assignment piece that you guys have is how are you going to handle the 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 chainlet application asking for generations from this uh, okay. process or this system, right? right? The the way that I would think to approach it is we we have two ways we can do it. We know one way is going to work, right? Get mm -hmm. a task ID and then keep asking if it's done until it's done and then pass that response, right? So we, in yeah. application, say in Chainlet, when you're building your custom LLM class, you're going mm -hmm. to say, put a while loop that says until it's done, go. There's an example of this exact thing in the uh, run.py uh, so this is this run.py uses this exact pattern, right? We send a prompt, we get a task ID, we wait till it says it's done, and then we return it. Boom, okay. right? That's that's one way we can do this. Um, mm -hmm. If you if you want to be clever about it, right? What you can do is you can create a system that's going to allow you to have many different requests. This is this is something that I wouldn't suggest to do unless you're very ambitious and this is what the thing that you care about. Uh, for most people, the the pattern that's expressed in run.py is going to be perfectly fine. But when you're thinking about this system, just know if you get a lot of task IDs and then you can query to see when they're done and then return responses, that's starting to sound very asynchronous to me, right? That's starting to sound like a flow that you could make asynchronous where we barrage an endpoint with a number of requests and then we 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 query when they're done and then we receive the response when only when they're complete. Um, but uh, yes, uh, the idea is we, the pattern that you see in run is likely going to be the pattern that you're going to want to use because it's, it's available to you. Uh, but if you're, if you're wanting to go the next step, making it uh, work more like an asynchronous process is probably going to be more uh, a bigger challenge. Okay. But yeah, it's a great yeah. question, right? We we engineer the front end so that the user doesn't have to do two things because we never mm -hmm. want our users to have to do two things. 
uh, <laughs> because they hate that. <laughs> you know. Of course, yeah. That's, that's that hence my question. Imagine so, Chat GPT, but like you you had the send button, and then you also had a refresh to see if there was a response button. You know, it would be a worse experience <laughs> to do it the second way. Bonnie, what's up? Yeah, um, I just joined late, but I, I can get a sense of what is all about. So my my question is, uh, um, in terms of this design choice, right? You uh, leveraging the salary. Uh, so what is the uh, like uh, when you see? Is it like you no know, low latency, um, or is can you can scale it horizontally? That that's why this design pattern, or maybe that's a follow up to that. Is if you want to, you know, uh, this production app which can handle now scale pretty well to multiple requests. Is it still this pattern pretty works or do you have any other recommendation to use maybe this message brokers um, uh, like, you know, instead of, or using some other system? So what's your, um, I mean, suggestion on that? We, we, could, we could have a whole 10 week program on the best way to build scaling LLM uh, infrastructure. Uh, the, the honest truth is that this is, again, this is an MLOps task. It's really outside of the, the LLM ops stack. It, it, it's, it's a bit, when you're thinking about these systems, this is exactly the question that you, the question you're asking is what MLOps engineers have been dealing with since day one, right? How do we, what's the best way to handle these things when we have these things that these these mechanisms that cost so much dang compute, right? LLM is made to compute problem harder, and there are different patterns that we can go into. Uh, it maybe during community sessions, like we can use text generation interface, which is available through SageMaker, and we can actually have SageMaker do this. Uh, you know, we can. Do, there's a number of different ways we can approach. We can use RayServe. There, there, there's a thousand different ways that we can approach this, but the idea is we want to see the pattern that we're talking about, right? We want to see the idea behind what's happening. So we're starting with this lower level, less abstracted version um, in, in order to be able to build intuition when we talk about those larger systems. Because TGI is great, but it's relying on processes like this as well as some very clever uh, uh, sharding of various uh, endpoints and, and everything like that. So, or uh, of various uh, tensors. So I think the, the idea is uh this is this is the basic pattern i i hesitate to say basic because it's uh if you implement this in your company you're going to be you're going to be doing a lot better but uh it's the less abstracted version of some of the other like pre-builds uh in production if you're dependent on your uh your cloud provider uh they're going to have services that are similar to this right so with crazy combinations of things like Lambda and uh, ECS and everything like that, we can build a system that's going to be very effective at scaling. It doesn't require us to create uh, create or use Celery, right? But when it comes to those systems, if we don't have a place to start, uh, I think it's, it, you just wind up not being able to understand what the heck's going on. Um, but yes, those that's a great question. Uh, there are lots of ways to approach it. Um, this is not the best way to approach it, but it is a a good way to approach it when you're getting started, and especially when what you have is limited resources and lots of requests. Yeah. yeah. Pipe, pipe, pipe. I'm going to go ahead and stop. Uh, I have gone on for quite a long time, but uh, great questions. Thank you so much for them. And we'll uh, I'll stop sharing my uh, my screen. Greg, you muted. Greg, you're muted, sir. Greg, you're muted. And oh, he freeze framed. Chainlet for UX. Reaches out a fast. There we go. There we go. You're back. You're back. He's back. He's back. He's back. Sorry, sorry guys. Okay, yeah. So, um, in case you missed it, Chainlets for UX. It reaches out to Fast API with some text. Redis is for scalability. It's going to be doing the work. It's going to be doing some working. It's about that task queue and the web server. That's what Fast API is for. 
And this is gonna allow us to interact with the LLM through REST API and allow us to manage the prompts, AKA the task IDs. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort of build this out um, as, we, as we get into the production piece of this week. And so what, I, what, what the task is here for you guys is to try to take Chainlet and put it in the container. That's the task, all right? And this is gonna make it super easy for us to deploy however we want. And, you know, the, the Llama 2 piece is just gonna be pulled down from Hugging Face. So you're just gonna need the Hugging Face token there to, to get that guy. And the idea is, you know, can we deploy this on an AWS or Azure or GCP like service using just the container so you get actually a public IP address. And we will provide you with a full solution to this. Um, but for now, what we wanna do is we wanna get you guys building and just to address one, one piece of feedback we got on the previous class, you know, it was kind of said like, hey, we, we never have enough time to finish the assignment in, in class and true. And, you know, we actually don't want you to finish the assignment in class. We want you to kind of struggle with it afterwards and to kind of deal with it after class. So we would generally like to give you, you know, 30 minutes or so. It has been true that we've been coming down to about 20 minutes and that's not ideal. We could do a better job managing the time in the room. So we are working on that, but we are going to have about 20 minutes today again for you guys to head out into breakout rooms and to get building with one another. And for those of you that went to the community session on this, you're going to be a little further ahead. For those of you with the background in this, you're going to be a little further ahead. Everybody's asking for this MLOps stuff. So we, we did our best to put it together for you today. We'd love to know what you think when you get through with this. Um, and, you know, again, thanks for being an early adopter of LLM Ops. We're actually actively working to articulate what it means and how it's not ML Ops. So look forward to uh, this stuff coming in the next two days as we continue to sort of figure this all out together uh, next Thursday, Tuesday is when we're kind of going to outline our big ideas on LLM Ops level zero, LLM Ops level one and how those interface and interact with ML ops. And you know, we hope that this was useful to you today. So with that, we'll open up the breakout rooms for 20 minutes. We've sent the link to the GitHub repo and the homework assignment in the chat, as well as in Discord. And we'll see you back in 20 for any feedback that you have before we get out of here for the night. Thanks everybody. Enjoy, see you soon. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, questions, comments, concerns, <laughs> issues, um, any feedback at all on what we just forced you guys into? LOL. Is this as complicated as it appears? No. <laughs> 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 it is it does appear complicated and uh i think that's because there's a lot of different files and there's a lot of words but uh it's not very complicated the the idea is that we just want to add a new service to our docker compose and we want that service to be our chainlet application and we want it to be able to talk to fast api yeah and then uh when we have that and then we uh, have the ability to talk to fast API in our chainlet application. We will define a custom LLM that just wraps that endpoint. Uh, that's it. So there's, there's, there's the, yes, there's a lot of different files, but you guys will touch very few of them. Specifically, you won't touch any of the fast API uh, stack. You need to be able to deploy it. So you, you have to, you have to do that. Uh, but everything else is just in the Docker Compose file and then in the Chainlet application. Uh, those are the files that you will need to edit, uh, as it were. Uh, so Chris, uh, question is, um, so the Chainlet would be its own Docker container, right? Correct. And so would be, um, so would be the Fast API container, right? Correct. And they all both would be part of a Docker Compose, right? Docker Correct. Compose would be coordinating them. Okay, yes. good. Uh, now, uh, 
in the chainlet, in the app.py, in the init method, right? Yeah. All this, whatever it is doing with the, with the open AI, right? Yep. With the GPT 3.5, that needs to be now you're saying custom chain, right? You have to build there. Which yeah. Would talk, which would talk to the fast API, right? Well, it will just be a wrapper. Yeah, basically you're going to wrap the... You're gonna wrap the uh the setup.py as a custom LLM in Langchain. And then you're gonna set the that equal to LLM. And all and that's gonna do is make requests to the fast API endpoint. Setup.py. Where is that? Uh, uh run.py. Run.py from yes. the fast API thing, right? That's right. Yeah. Right, 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 yeah, right. Yeah. And that's okay. all you need to do. Yeah. So, but, but but how do you how do you wrap it up, right? Like, um, how do you make it up, um, make it appear as a chain to the chainlit app? Deepak, how do you wrap it up? Is exactly the question I'm asking myself right now. So uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and pause that. I'm gonna let him async respond to you, my friend. And <laughs> uh, and I think so. One of the things that we're, we we want to do is we wanted to expose you guys to this stuff, and you know, and then you know it's kind of the classic thing, like show you that this is kind of the hard way. And then this is the easy way kind of thing. Um, so on Thursday, and so we saw today, we have to learn some ML ops if we want to do production ML ops stuff. And we just replace the ML with LLM. We have to still kind of do some stuff there. That is kind of classic. Many of you probably know it. Chainlit and Fast API, we saw that they have very similar syntax. That's one key point I want everybody to take away from today, is that if you can understand one, you have a good shot at understanding the other with the decorator functions. And the open source deployment is not as hard as it looks to get Llama 2 in there. And we can absolutely swap out GPT 3.5, GPT 4 for any open source thing that we need to do. Okay, so... On Thursday, we're going to try to connect the dots of this week. We didn't get to the Amazon ECS deployment, but we will show that. And we will show the complete sort of end-to-end -end deployment on Thursday. So work on this before Thursday, because you're kind of going to you're kind of going to see the answer on Thursday. And you know, so if see if you can get this done between now and Thursday on your own. We're going to talk about benchmarks. So from the general language understanding evaluation to the MMLU the massive multilingual language understanding. And then we're going to talk about how Ragus fits into all of this. And then time permitting, we're going to also look at wand B, weights and biases, and how that is a key LLM ops, true LLM ops tool that talks about prompt caching. That'll probably be something that bleeds into the following week on Tuesday, because we, we also probably want to tell you a little bit about some of the harnesses that you can use for the more um, more spectacular benchmarking approaches that you could take. And we'll give you some codes for that. Things like Eleuther AI, things like Helm. So we're going to, we're going to, we're kind of going to bring all this together on Thursday. Um, the evaluation and the prompt caching will likely move and bleed into next Tuesday. And then of course, next Thursday, we'd love for anybody who has a project to present that's your day.